Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, March 19th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a financial advisor. I cannot tell you what to do with your money. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. So first thing I want to talk about, this chart jumped out to me. This is the German Germany's wholesale price um, percentage increase year over year. You will note this is the last, uh, we're up 16% uh, year over year in the re re most recent reading, which was actually done on February 5th, I believe. And so this is before the invasion. So we haven't seen the uh, prices, the, the, the price rises that have happened since the, um, since the hostilities that have broken out in, in Ukraine. And, you know, with the jump in energy prices, the jump in all prices uh, as things um, jump around, uh, nickel, oil, some of these things that made the news. Um, this is this is going to be a problem. We are, we already had significant uh, price increases before uh, before the hostilities broke out. So I know this is anecdotal, but this is something that we've seen that's been similar in many other countries, and it's one of the things that I have been talking about that of the unintended consequences of what's going on in, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine. And so the, what I consider really, really, I mean, unprecedented reaction to the, to the Russian incursion into Ukraine. I mean, I, again, I, I don't think everybody has thought this through. And I think that what you're starting to see now, you know, not everybody signed on to this deal. Uh, somebody did an analysis. I was listening to a podcast and only about less than 50% of the world's population is actually in living in countries where uh, that have actually jumped on this self-sanctioning uh, bandwagon. So, you know, the Europe, the United States, obviously, uh, but, you know, China, India, you know, we had the administration this week in the U.S. threatening making veiled threats to India that if you buy Russian oil, which they did, I saw that there was a cargo, 3 million barrels of discounted oil that India bought from Russia. So, you know, I mean, this is not a UN Security Council uh, sanctions. I mean, this is, this is uh, unilaterally being put on by the um, United States and Europe. So, why wouldn't India buy the oil? But the point I'm trying to make, getting back to, to you know, we're going to see more of this. So get ready for it. Um, and we're in a situation now where the Federal Reserve wrote, raised rates for the first time, I think, in like four years in the U.S. last week. I think it was a quarter percent. I mean, so you, <laughs> with the inflation rate nearly 8%, you're still, you know, you're running, you know, massively negative interest rates. So, um I don't think that we know, we haven't obviously seen all the second order effects and, and knock on effects of the decisions that were made, but I think you're going to see more of this type of thing, not less. And I think it's going to become painful for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, there was a poll, I think I saw, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but I think I saw a poll where I, it shocked me. I says like 30% of the people in the United States 30% of the people that were polled, let's put it that way, um, said that they were willing to have a nuclear exchange over this war in Ukraine. I mean, I find that just wacko. And, uh, but uh, anyway, um, I suspect this thing will be over in April. Uh, I don't want to get too far into that. Uh, you know, I haven't made a reality check in a while, and I've been debating whether to make them because they're so depressing, right? I mean, what, what would I talk about? Okay, the war, the war there, uh, who started it? I could go through the whole history, and all I would get was a bunch of people that are, um, you know, don't know history, don't know 
uh, the historical narrative that are emotional that are going to attack me. I could talk about the transgender swimmer person that won the um, uh, swimming meet the other day and, you know, how two plus two equals five in this uh, weird society. I mean, it's just not good for my mind and soul to be just continually talking about all these negative things. So I'm just going to stick to the finances for right now. Um, I don't have enough time anyways to do that. I know some people were asking me to do more of the um, reality checks, but I mean, it's just negative stuff continuously. So uh, it's just, it's, it takes a lot of effort and just going around basically looking for the, the worst things you can find to, to comment on. It's just not, uh, not very positive. So I'll just stick to the reality checks, but understand uh, this is anecdotal, but we've been pointing this out. This is just, as these things come up, I'm going to report them. And uh, this isn't good, right? This is like 1970s stuff. We're going back to the seventies again. You know, that's something I've talked about before. Um, I saw a tweet this week where a guy, I don't know who it was. I can't remember. He had like over a million dollar portfolio in gross stocks, you know, maybe six months ago. It's been whittled down by over half. Guys, the narrative has shifted. What worked for the last 20, 30, 40 years isn't going to work. Going forward, we're into a new era of um, deglobalization, inflation, um, lack of investment in resources, um, all warfare. And these things are inflationary, not deflationary. So um, I suspect that uh, we're going to see some period of time here that um, a lot of people are not prepared for. And I think as uh, people come around to the idea of what's really happening, that you're going to see um, sector rotation out of a lot of these growth stocks and a lot of that. But it takes a while, right? I mean, it's not like a bear market or something that's worked for years and years and people have made a ton of money on. They're just going to people are just going to, within a span of a week or two or a month or two, are going to shift their ideas. That's just not how markets work. So it's a, you know, that's the thing about a bear market. Most of the people that are in the market nowadays have not experienced a grinding, relentless bear market, right? It just goes down and down and down with relief rallies that the, and you think it's over and it goes down and down and down. And uh, if you have the previous mentality of what worked the previous decade, doesn't look like it's going to work going forward and you can't get your mind, you can't shift gears in your mind and, and shift to the new narrative. You just get, you just get ground into dust. And uh, I suspect that um, we're going to see a lot of that uh, over the next years. So, you know, I keep talking about the, the upcoming food crisis we're going to have. We are going to have one. I don't know how bad it's going to be. I hope it won't be bad. But, you know, we're starting to see, and I'll show some more slides later, country after country now is shutting down exports of their food. People, the governments in these countries are, are starting to realize what's happening, and they're going to make sure that they keep their stocks up, their stores of food up before they start exporting. And look at these countries, right? This is, the, this is from the UN, and these are the Af African dependents on wheat from Russia and Ukraine. So this is the share of wheat imports for each one of these countries, okay, from these African countries. And obviously the uh, Russian Federation is in red and blue is Ukraine. So you can see like a country like Somalia imports 100% of its um, wheat uh, majority from Ukraine. There's not going to be a very, if any, grain harvest in Ukraine this year. And then the rest, you know, 30% from Russia. So. Uh, you go down these just different, you know, look at Egypt. We've talked about Egypt before. This is a country with like 80, 90 million people. And it imports 80% uh, of its grain or of its wheat. Um, Sudan, Congo, or Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sen Senegal, uh, Tanzania, Rwanda, Madagascar. I mean, you go down the list, right? So you even have like the smallest or the country with the least amount of imports is Eritrea, and it's still like 40%. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that we could be facing a food crisis, I mean, that we haven't ever seen in modern times. And it's been self-imposed. Self and I'm not going to get into, like I said, who's the bad guy. Some people are going to, you know, the administration here in the U.S. is blaming high gas prices on Vladimir Putin. I mean, there's no discussion about, you know, lack of investment, ESG mandates, anything like that. Nothing, not, it's just 
you know, it's like a Hollywood, it's like a Marvel comics movie, right? The Avengers are over here and then the bad guys are over here and uh, it's simplistic, but it doesn't really matter, right? Because uh, this is going to lead then to unforeseen um, or possibility of unforeseen knock-on effects, you know? I mean, what's what's it look like on your TV when you have tens of million people that are, um, you know, don't have food? What's that look like? And uh, what are the repercussions in a country like Egypt if a large portion of the population doesn't have enough to eat? You know, what kind of political and social upheaval do you see? I've talked about this before. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of nervous about this. I mean, one person wrote in the comments last week, I don't, they didn't feel good about you know, making money off this. It's not your, you, you didn't cause this. Okay. So what, what should you do? I mean, investment's going to be needed. So you might as well be an investor. Um, as you've seen, a lot of the fertilizer stocks have already moved tremendously, but there's, there's other opportunities. There always is, and we're trying to find them. Um, but, uh, you know, I even saw, um, I'm going to show a slide later on. I mean, Argentina is even now shutting down its exports and it's, you know, food self-sufficient. So countries, that's what governments typically do, right? They'll just panic, lock everything down, don't export anything because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't have enough information to say that, oh yeah, just keep doing business as usual. Or, you know, wait till the price is really, you know, double or triple and then release the stocks. I mean, that seems cynical, but this is the way things are, right? You know, Russia has said it's not going to export just about anything, uh, for at least three months, or I think some of the raw materials to the end of the year. I can't even keep track of all the sanctions and counter sanctions and 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 you know all the stuff that's going on. But what it what it does mean is the globalization has just been the globalized just in time delivery system has just been smashed, and countries now are realigning themselves as individual countries that are self sufficient or into regional blocks. I think you're going to see more of that. So this means higher prices, folks. That's just what it means. You know, we have a, a, a large amount of people in the U.S. even. It's not the dichotomy in wealth and um, in the U.S. is not small either, right? I mean, we have a large portion of the population that, that if they, you know, need to get a set of tires, they can't afford to do it. They don't have $400, $500 in a checking account. And uh, so what happens when prices go up, you know, food prices double or all prices go up over time, right? especially as energy continues to go up, you know, it's just going to build on itself. And so I think there's going to, this is going to be a decade of a lot of turmoil, a lot of social and economic upheaval, political upheaval that we can't even forecast. So again, it, it, it goes back to what I've said on several other occasions. You have to be active. You have to be nimble. And uh, one thing that I haven't seen in a large portion of the population, not, it's not a criticism of this audience, but the, the ease with which people will fall into some simplistic emotional narrative, it simply has, I mean, whether it was the, the disease that cannot be mentioned, or Putin man bad, or whatever, the, the lack of critical thinking, the, the simplistic thinking is just not going to work for, for problems that we're going to be seeing here in the next, you know, several years on this. And, and, and if you're approaching it with a you know, Hollywood Marvel Comics movie mentality, I'm, I'm not sure you're going to uh, be able to uh, overcome that and uh, come out the other end in good shape. Again, it goes back to purging oneself of biases. It doesn't really matter if I like the fact that there's a Russian incursion in Ukraine, or if I'm pro-Ukrainian or pro-Russian, I have to look at it for what it is. I can't control the situation. What are the effects going to be? And how is that going to affect my investments, my life, you know, these things, okay? That's not selfish. That's just prudence in my mind. That's being pragmatic. And so uh, I really think that if you have not trained yourself to critically think, you really need to, uh, you know, put that on your agenda here pretty quick. So here we have uh, a tweet. Uh, there's a lot of tweets on here that I grabbed this week from the uh, president of France, uh, Macron, we will have deep food crisis in next 12 to 18 months in Africa and Mideast due to the Ukraine war. Well, we already showed you why. You know, it's interesting why France would say that. You know, France has a lot of formal, former colonial possessions 
in uh, in Africa. I can't name them all. The Francophone Africa, like the Congo. I shouldn't call it the Congo. DRC. Uh, um, you know, Ivory Coast. Um, I can't think of all the countries that are uh, French speaking. Uh, Chad. They. I think they had some stuff going on there. Or maybe it was uh, the Italians in Libya. I can't remember. But what's interesting is they they spend a lot of time in Africa doing peacekeeping, protecting their um, uranium mines in Mali, in Niger. And these are places that, uh, you know, could come under political unrest if the population becomes hungry. Then, like I said, that creates effects for the resources that are being extracted there if the country's in upheaval because everybody's starving to death. You know, does that mean the French Foreign Legion has to go in? So you're starting to see more and more people starting to wake up to uh, what's getting ready to happen. And uh, so I, I wanted to point that out. Again, you know, Cycle Bottom, here's a pretty good guy that I follow or person. I don't know if it's who, I think they're out of Hong Kong. I, I, I can't remember. But, uh, you know, it's created by Western sanctions. Uh, you're not going to have enough fertilizer, not going to have enough planting. And uh, we're going to have food shortages. It's that simple. This, this was not a weather, you know, I, I was bullish on agricultural commodities even before this happened. And this is just, you know, supercharging everything. And uh, like I said, it's, 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 it's going to be something to behold, I think. Here's uh, another tweet from uh, Alexander Stahel, a guy that we uh, like following. He's a money manager out of Switzerland. And I put to here, there'll be a lot of trouble. I mean, here we are, a Chinese farmer, quote, if the trade of fertilizers and grain is interrupted, how can we do spring field work? How can we hold the rice bowls of our 1.54 billion population in our own hands? There will be a lot of trouble. And, uh, you know, this is a um, article from the South China Morning Post. Um, so, again, this is a lot of this is anecdotal, I know, but uh, you can see what's getting ready. You can see the storm forming on the horizon. So here's Doomberg, you know, I talked about earlier uh, in a, earlier in the uh, video. Argentina has cut off exports of soybean meal and soybean oil, global economic vapor lock in progress. I mean, you should follow Doomberg. They actually wrote a pretty good article about uh, the fact that um, we were, this is even before, like I said, before this hostilities broke out, like last October, I believe. I can't remember the title of the article, but it's just about this whole, lack of uh, food that we were going to have just based on some of the issues we had around high natural gas prices in Europe that had that had been high regardless of the uh, uh, of the sanctions and everything that was before it, we, the fertilizer plants they're not being able to um, you know make enough nitrogen and so now you've supercharged it right so I wanted to point this out it's interesting you know I think the several European countries like Germany, for example, have gotten, shall we say, buyer's remorse, you know, this emotional knee-jerk reaction to uh, uh, basically what amounts to a border crisis somewhere in eastern Ukraine that most people a month ago couldn't find on a map. Uh, I don't think a lot of thought went into this. And this, this is when people say to me, well, you don't understand, John, this is a, this is a big plan by the Davos crowd, the masters of the universe, this was all orchestrated so that they could create an economic collapse. I don't buy it. I think that uh, we have a bunch of stupid idiots. Yeah, I think we have, you know, people that are play acting about taking over the world and they and here and there they can do some things. But in the end, look at this. This is this is like a circulatory system. This is the, you know, a map of Europe, obviously. Um, here's Western Europe, here's Eastern Europe, here's you know, Russia, Ukraine over here. And this is interesting. I mean, this is like a circulatory system of a body when you're looking at an anatomy class or something. You know, all of this oil, which is in red and all this gas in green and shows how it flows into Western Europe. This is the lifeblood. Russia is the lifeblood of what, uh, to Western Europe. Without the energy that, that Europe gets from Russia, Ru uh, Europe would die, literally. Uh, it would be thrown back into you know, pre-industrial times very quickly. And so it's, it's kind of perplexing um, that this knee-jerk reaction happened and they were going to sanction this and sanction that and seize the central bank's assets and do all these crazy things. And all they have to do, all 
Russia has to do is turn the taps off, and you, but they haven't done that yet. I mean, there's actually still gas flowing through the pipelines of in Ukraine through this, through some of the combat areas. So um, it's interesting that uh, they haven't done that yet. But this is uh, you know this is interesting. I think you got a country like Germany, like I said, that has starting to get buyer's remorse now. They, they you know, they they've they've they've. I think people are starting to think this through. And I'm hopeful that uh, this will lead to some pressure to uh, have people uh, walk back some of their more wild statements. But um, uh, who's beholden to who here in this uh, particular, if you look at this map? And so people ask me, you know, and I give a lot of thought to this, and people do ask me, what do I think is going to happen with crude prices? Is oil going to keep going up? I'm not into this, but I found out about it. Should I get in? And this is what I look at. I look at crude inventories, right, from different sources. Um, there's a lot of people smarter than me that track this every week. I follow them on Twitter. As long as inventories of crude are decreasing, um, and that's just a whole, you know, all of the manifestations of the supply demand, de demand dynamics that I've talked about, where you have rising supply among populations in India and other places, China, that are getting more wealthy as they enter their uh, more uh, S-curve of their energy usage as they get uh, attain certain levels of wealth. Um, this is what we see, right? We're seeing just in the last year, basically, um, if you look at, it's hard to see the colors here, but suffice to say, over the last year, we're seeing a 1.5 million barrel per day draw on world uh, inventories. And so that tells me that uh, demand is there and supply is not. And uh, I don't see anything on the horizon that leads me to believe that we're going to have huge jumps in new supply coming online anytime in, in the near future. And so what I would suggest to you is that the price of the commodity is going to have to go up sufficiently to choke off the demand. And we've talked about that um, over the last couple of weeks. I know a lot of this may be redundant for a lot of folks, but this, this is it. You know, you, and you still have oil stocks in many cases um, trading at levels where, you know, maybe re reflective of 60 to $70 crude, not $100 crude. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is the market has not upset, accepted the fact that we are in fact in a new era. We are in an era of scarcity and the market has not adjusted the prices for these um, commodities or for these producers uh, sufficiently. And so, you know, I know there's a lot of pressure, ESG pressure, not to hold these stocks and things like that. That's fine. I mean, I'll buy them. Other smart people are buying them and the companies are buying back their own stock. As I've demonstrated several times as Eric Nuttall at, um, Nine Point Partners is demonstrated. He puts the charts out, you know, every couple of weeks, you know, as at different price points of crude, you know, a majority of the companies like in Canada can buy themselves back in three to five years just out of their own cash flow and their stock buyback. So pay down their debt and buy themselves back. So this is the level of cash flow that's being generated. And uh, at some point, you know, uh, last year, energy was the best performing sector so far this year, it's the best performing sector. At some point, if you're not owning, ener owning energy and you are a money manager, I don't think you're going to be a money manager for very long if you, if you go two years underperforming. So uh, remains to be seen. Maybe the, maybe the spirit of ESG and the religion of ESG and the influence of um, shareholders of, and, and pension holders and all these things and board members running these trusts is sufficient to overcome uh, the people's greed. But uh, I, I don't think so. In the end, uh, I think the general investor comes back and uh, we re-rate re higher. You know, I don't know how high crude's going to go. We see all kinds of uh, predictions. But as I pointed out before, um, you know, people adjust themselves to different price levels, right? I mean, the price goes to 100, people complain, they still have to go to work, right? They may around the margin not uh, do things, but they may not buy that new truck or whatever. But, uh, you know, at some point, um, the price will get high enough where it will dent demand and sufficient supply will come online. 
I mean, I've seen some recent well results for, I think it was Baytex Energy and a couple wells. I mean, they, at these current prices, I think I, they were like 400% internal rates of return, something crazy like that. So um, there are places where you can drill and make a tremendous amount of money and pe therefore people will drill. Um, so, uh, but smaller companies and wildcatters or private companies are not going to, their activities are not going to be sufficient to overcome the, this, uh, this deficit. So we'll just have to see. I don't know what the threshold price is, which, which will cause new investment to come in and solve the problem. Every other time we've had a price spike in any commodity, eventually demand um, is crimped by the high price and new supply comes on every single time. I do not think this time will be different. I just don't know the timing and I don't know what the price thresholds are that drive those uh, behavioral changes. So here we go, $200 oil. Um, this is from Bloomberg. While $200 seems like an extremely high number, others in the industry also think it's possible. In January, commodity trader Doug King said a barrel could hit that level within five years. Nigeria's oil minister has also said it could get that high before falling back into the 150 range. He's talking about this uh, guy, Peter, I can't remember his name. I think it's Peter Andr Andurand. Anyways, he's a, he was a, he is, was, and is a big time oil trader who's made some pretty uh, decent returns over years. He's, he says he sees a process of the economy acclimating to higher and higher numbers, just like we were just talking about. So I think it's, you know, there's a lot of recency bias generally in people's minds. Generally, we get used to recent prices. And at first we think $100 is expensive. We complain. I don't mean, I don't mean we, like people in general complain. And then they get used to 100 and then they complain at 120 and then they complain at 140, but they get used to higher levels over time. So then it's a question of, is it still worth using this oil? You know, and if you look at since 2008, 150 then is 220 today in today's dollars. As inflation, as an inflation measure, you take the global GDP deflator, then it's $220. So the way I think of it is, is it more bullish today than, than then? Yes, and it's more bullish today than then. So basically, the, we've talked about this before. Um, the last time oil peaked in 2008, it peaked at uh, like $148 a barrel. And I went to an inflation calculator and showed you that uh, because of inflation and money printing since then, just a short 13 years, um, $150 a barrel oil in 2008 would equate to like $210, $220 a barrel now. So uh, when somebody asks me, how can we go higher? Absolutely. And I expect we will over time. And I think people probably will be shocked by how high we event eventually go. And I think that's going to cause political and economic turmoil, right? I mean, as we said before, uh, people will not going to stand. I mean, you're, you would be, you would be literally talking like eight, nine dollar a gallon gasoline. And it's just not going to fly. I mean, the economy would not handle that and it will cause political upheaval. But as I'm getting ready to show you, I think in an upcoming slide, politicians always have a way to figure out how to make the situation worse. And so I wanted to point this out. Uh, you should follow this guy on Twitter also, Otavia, Tavi Costa. He runs a hedge fund or a, not a hedge fund, but an investment fund that uh, invests mostly, I think, in uh, precious metals, but I think commodities, uh, resource stocks. But uh, here's what he says. The U.S. continues to dump its strategic petroleum reserve like there is no tomorrow. The government is now down to 33 days worth of oil supply at its current implied demand. That is one of the lowest levels in history. So obviously, you know, the Biden administration is worried about what's going to happen in the November congressional elections if the oil price is, you know, high. People don't... <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, they can stand up there and blame uh, Vladimir Putin, which is fine. Nobody, but nobody can do anything to Vladimir Putin. What they can do is go down to their ballot box. That's what Bubis likes to do, right? Somebody needs to do something. Somebody needs to pay for this and, and vote out the incumbents. And I suggest that uh, that's probably what's going to happen, um, especially as, uh, you know, we see, uh, like we said, you know, the price of energy is... In, in every product and service basically that we buy. So you're gonna have not just oil going up but the general price inflation of everything that because of transportation costs and just the input costs from uh, hydrocarbons. And they're trying to do what they can to, to, to um, 
mitigate the price increases, but uh, they're running out of ammo here. I mean, look at this drop. I mean, this is crazy. It's just like straight down. And so they're going to be, what do they do after that, right? Well, this is what we were talking about. Uh, here we have the uh, green chicken from Doomberg. They put this, um, found this on their Twitter feed. California lawmakers are set to announce a $400 gas rebate proposal for every California taxpayer. Now, I don't know if this is actually passed. I, I don't follow the politics in California. What I'm trying to, um, the point I'm getting across is why you see seed Cuppy. Cuppy talked about this, I think, uh, in a couple of interviews I saw the last couple few weeks. Basically, you're seeing governments now step up because, you know, they're political animals, these politicians. They want to get reelected. So, Let's go out and, you know, make a lot of dumb decisions that cause the price of oil to go up and therefore gasoline that affects Bubis's, uh pocketbook and instead of reversing the dumb decisions and dumb policies that have compounded on themselves over the last 10 or 15 or 20 years that have caused this energy crisis and then been exacerbated by more poor decisions uh, as we deal with our geopolitical uh, partners, uh, we won't fix that we'll give you a rebate. So we'll pay you. And so that uh, we can, it looks like we're doing something. Somebody has to do something, right? Uh, so we'll give you a rebate and we're going to pass windfall profit taxes like you know Senator Warren wants to do. And we're gonna channel that money back to the consumer to alleviate. So that interrupts and interferes with the price seeking mechanism. When the price of gasoline goes up, it's, uh, you know, the most highest use for that gasoline will be bought by the person that has the highest use for it to get back and forth to work and not necessarily the guy going out in his bass boat on Saturday. And so you're not at what you're doing here is you're interfering with the ability of the higher price to affect people's behavior and have them use less energy and therefore bring the price down in a market economy. And so if you subsidize people's use of something that's already priced higher, it's going to have a tent, they're not going to change their behavior. Therefore, the price is going to stay high or move higher. And this isn't the only place we saw this. We're seeing this all over the world. Again, anecdotally, we've seen it uh, proposals in Italy, we've seen proposals in Japan, other places where we're just going to subsidize your fuel use. Hopefully, then the price will come down or it'll be somebody else's problem. Uh, but, but you know, this taking collectively has a tendency to not allow for, like I said, interrupt the price seeking uh, mechanism because, you know, people don't trust the markets. People in the West do not trust the markets. People in the developed world do not trust markets anymore. Um, so they want big daddy government or some politician to, um, you know, fix it for them, kiss my life and make it better. And so what I put this title aside is politicians are the best friend of speculators. So what am I getting at here? Well, you could make the case that this will be helpful to keeping the uh, oil price at a, at a higher level for a longer period of time. So that would be good for us. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't control these things. I'm just telling you that I try to look beyond, you know, the front page, you know, as Don Cox, a famous uh, guy at BMO Capital that used to do uh, the calls, uh, uh, he was a history major, but he was a very good investor because he always said, look for the, don't look at the front page story in the newspaper, look for the, for the story on page 20 that's going to be on the first page in a couple months. You know, the one that's buried in the back of the paper that no one reads, but, but it's going to be on the front page in six months. There's your opportunity. And so what I'm suggesting to you is, is that that's what we're trying to do here with these weekly calls these videos, these podcasts, and with the newsletter, the actionable intelligence alert newsletter. We're trying to, you know, we were, we've were we been talking about this food crisis for a while, even before this invasion. And now we have the president of France warning everybody that we're gonna have famine in Africa. Well, I mean, I mean, you should have already been buying, I think the first time I talked about um, fertilizer stocks was like a year ago. I know I was buying a couple of them, yeah, less, March. So um, you got to be ahead of the curve. If you're waiting till, you know, it shows up on the front of the Bloomberg, BNN, or, you know, Business Week or whatever, or, you know, the Wall Street Journal, you've already missed the boat. Again, like Don Cox said, what's the page 20 story that's moving to the front page? 
I thought this was pretty exciting. You know, one of the things that I think we were waiting for, we have a lot of retail money in the uranium market. Uh, that's why it seems to not really get a lot of traction sometimes. I mean, we're in a bull market. It's moving higher. I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with the returns I have. Uh, like I said, we were in some of these things three years ago. We have multi-baggers. But um, here's a tweet by John Quakes. Uh, evidently, uh, like I said, I, I had a, not a lot of time to put my video together this week, so I grabbed a lot of different Twitter uh, feeds or Twitter screenshots. But evidently, this uh, large hedge fund, um, Caxton Associates, filed a filing with the SEC that they had become a 10% or larger shareholder in the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust with a reported um, investment holding of over 18 million units, that would be the market value as of, I think, two days ago of $257 million. So this is what we wanted to see, right? It's like, when is the big money going to wake up and then move in to basically this small market? You know, uh, one of the things that I talked about is, you know, legendary speculator Doug Casey has said that, uh, you know, a gold bull market is really something to be seen because it's, it's analogous to trying to put the contents you know, the gold uh, stock, mining stock sector is so small, it's equivalent or it's analogous to um, trying to get money into it. it's very difficult. So it's analogous to trying to put the contents of Hoover Dam through a garden hose. And he went on to say about the uranium market, it's so much smaller than even how the small gold market that uh, it's an, a uranium uh, bull market is the... Uh, analogous to trying to put the contents of Hoover Dam through a drinking straw. And so what I'm getting at here, uh, if you if you follow me, is that you have a very, very small market cap, okay? You have this huge amount of capital out there, and this very, very small market cap market um, of uranium securities, physical uranium and such, and that when large, you know, when we would get into the, you know, I pointed out the, 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 the the stages of, you know, the smart money gets in the, then the uh, uh, early people, and then you get the, the general mania. And this is what we've been waiting for is for institutional money to pick up on the story of the supply demand dynamics. And then this, this is tremendous. This won't be the last time this happens. So I'm not sure if this is, I didn't follow up on this. So I, I, I don't know exactly what, you know, I, I, I want to go read the file and see what's really going on. But if this is in fact what's happening, that large, large capital now is moving into this market. Um, uh, you know, these people all talk. Uh, there's a buzz that get, starts happening. And then, you know, we start, you know, realizing that flywheel effect. And so if we see big money like this start coming in to the uranium market, then uh, we could conceivably be looking at a... Um, a big move higher. You know, I don't know if I reported it last week, but the, uh, I think, I don't know if it went through. I know that on the Senate side, I think the U.S. Senate passed a resolution to ban the importation of Russian uranium, enriched uranium into the United States. I don't know if it passed the House. I don't know if the president signed it. I have to follow up. But this is another thing, right? So we're going to go out, like I said, suicide by cop. We're going to run out guns blazing uh, in an emotional outburst and, you know, get blown away. I mean, 20% of the United States' electricity comes from, from nuclear power. Uh, I hope they have a plan for the backup uh, of this. So, you know, I think with all of this rush to sanction, emotionalism, hysteria, I mean, what are you doing if you're a fuel buyer? What if, what if you're a fuel buyer at Duke or Exelon and you see something like this, what does it make you think? I, I better, we better get activated and call up Cameco and Kaz Adamprom and start making some figure out where we're going to get our uranium for these reactors for the next three to five years, because it looks like, you know, we're going to have uh, a, another big move in uranium and we're going to get, you know, we could get frozen out. It's not even going to be a case, guys, I think, of what price you're going to have to pay. It's going to be, will you be able to get sufficient uranium? Now, there's plenty of uranium in the ground, but the problem is, as we go through this cycle, that's what happened last time, right? You had the, the mine problems with Cameco that they had, and that created a frenzy that people were afraid that they were going to not be able to have sufficient uranium. Remember, the thing that you don't want to happen if you are a uranium, if you're a nuclear utility, you're sitting on these nuclear power plants that 
you know, cost you billions and billions of dollars to build. Running out of fuel is not an option. It's no, it's not like in a coal plant where you can shift to natural gas on some of the boilers or fuel oil. You can't do that in a reactor. That goes without saying. And so I think that we could see, you know, as this, if depending on what happens in the news, you know, multiple things coming at these fuel buyers. We have these hedge funds moving in with big money. We don't know what the government's going to do if they're going to let us bring in Russian um, enriched fuel. We don't know what's going to happen. We better get activated. And you don't want to, it's musical chairs, right? You don't want to be, when the music stops, you don't want to be the kid without a chair and a $3 billion reactor sitting there that you got to lay up because you don't have fuel. Not good. So uh, you can see a, you can create a scenario where we get this spike in uranium prices. So I've got to talk about this because, you know, people, well, you know, John, we're just going to do EVs. We're just going to, uh, so when I do see these things, I like to uh, put them out there. Um, I guess poke the bear, poke people a little bit that are into this. But, you know, I don't know if these are exact. You know, Mark Mills at the Manhattan Institute had a really great paper on this. You can go there and check it out where he talked about how much dirt you have to move to get enough metal. So I don't know if this came from that, but, you know, this is uh, like to manufacture each EV battery. Well, uh, uh, you know, you're going to have some ankle biter come out and go, what size, how many kilowatts? This is just a general statement, guys. This isn't exact numbers. So, you know, to manufacture each EV battery, you must process 25,000 pounds of brine for the lithium needed, 30,000 pounds of ore for the cobalt needed, 5,000 pounds of ore for the nickel, 25,000 pounds of ore for copper, digging up 500,000. I do remember that number from Mills's paper, digging up 500,000 pounds of the Earth's crust for just one battery. And so this is what a real mining operation looks like. It's an open pit mine. And this is supposed to be sustainable and supposed to be environmentally friendly, I guess. Um, I just, I don't get it. You know, two plus two doesn't, e it equals four, not five. And so I don't know, you know, I think people that are pinning their hopes on EVs and, and, and you know, build back better and uh, renewable energy revolution, I, I, I don't think, they haven't convinced me um, of course, most of the machines that uh, you use to extract this are all run off diesel. So uh, I think in this, when I looked at this tweet, uh, somebody showed a picture of a mine hauling truck that was electric. Yes, there are some demonstration projects. They don't run all the mining equipment in the world off batteries, guys. It's, you know, uh, maybe they will do that. I don't know. But uh, this, this is not, this is a lot of material you have to move to get, and remember, uh, in the case of copper, for example, you're, you're, all, there hasn't been major discoveries in years, okay? And the head grades, when I talk about head grades, talking about the grades that you're getting uh, from the work faces in the mines, they're going down. Remember, it's just like any other thing. All the easy, easy to obtain, higher grade material has already been mined and used. And so you're getting to have to go deeper into more remote areas, more costly areas, um, and with, with more complex mining techniques to get the same amount of metal every year. And so, again, it gets back to the heads we win, tails we win more scenario. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Um, appreciate you. Uh, you know, I think we had over 5,000 views in the last video. So, again, I'm going to ask you to, if you would, uh, if you enjoy these videos, if you get something out of them, Obviously, I would like you to become a subscriber to my newsletter, which uh, you can find how to do that um, in the uh, notes below the video. But, uh, you know, simple things of making comments, engaging in the uh, comment section, liking the videos, whatever podcast uh, form you're listening to this on, if you could give us a rating on there, if you like this and enjoy it, it does help us out. We're trying to reach more people. This is a business of mine, so it, it does help me. And, uh, but, you know, I, I get a lot of comments in the comment section that people, you know, and I've, I feel good about it. I, I'm not, I'm trying to be humble about it. They're like, man, this, this channel needs more views. How come it doesn't have more views? Well, I ask you to help me out on that, you know, by liking the video, sharing the videos and um, commenting. And that tells the algorithm that people are interested in this. And it has a tendency to show it to more people that might be interested you know, this is a niche sector. How many people talk about this stuff, guys, really? I mean, it's not like entertainment or anything. It's, it's a niche thing. And uh, 
I'm not sure how many people, and, and, and I don't try to sensationalize everything. I, I don't, I see a lot of that on YouTube or different things. I, I'm just not that guy. I'm not going to, you know, how to this, buy this stock now a thousand percent returns in the next month or whatever. I, I don't like to do that. And uh, it seems, I don't know, it's sleazy. So I tr I'm just trying to plot along, build up trust, try to be a legit person, try to give value. And uh, like I said, if you enjoy this and you get value from this, help me out any way you can. And I appreciate it. All right, guys, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks a lot.